our Tuesday night class. Hopefully you all had a good Memorial Day weekend and uh, were able to celebrate our nation a little bit and get some rest too. Uh, but in any case, uh, we're uh, back into the Gospel of Luke uh, this evening. And we're going to finish up the narrative <coughs> of John the Baptist and the uh, baptism of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we'll get right into that. Excuse my voice as I start to speak here. Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, so uh, <clears throat> again, uh, we'll finish up that narrative uh, this evening and then get into the second half of chapter 3 on Thursday where we talk about the genealogy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And not quite sure how many lessons we'll have on that as of yet, uh, but we won't spend too much time on that and then we'll get into uh, the real uh, rest of the story of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, uh, Tonight, uh, let's see, announcements. Uh, this Sunday, I think it's going to be the first Sunday of June, right? Uh, so we'll celebrate communion on Sunday, so hopefully you can join us for that. Um, no prayer requests other than uh, keep my son and his girlfriend in your prayers as they travel back to Colorado uh, today in the next couple of days as they drive back. Uh, anything else? Anything else? Any other prayer requests? All right, then, let's begin. <clears throat> we begin, as we normally do, with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves an opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1, 9, the rebound technique, to ensure the feeling of God the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <clears throat> And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and now to glorify you through the study of your word. And Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you provided for us and our families and also for our church uh, this past day. And we ask that you continue to pour out your blessings onto us uh, this evening and throughout the day tomorrow so that we may serve you and walk in your will and in your plan. We especially thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, his work on the cross for our salvation and his continue, continued mediatorship on our behalf as we offer up our prayers to you. We also thank you for your spirit that empowers us and enables us to learn your word and also intercedes for us as necessary as well as a great intercessory in regard to our prayer life and our overall spiritual life. And we thank you for all the power that we have through the word and through the spirit in your great plan for our daily salvation. So, Father, we pray for our nation. We ask that you watch over it, protect and guide it. We thank you for this past week's memorial service and for us allowing, allowing us to Remember our fallen heroes who have gone before us that will provide freedom and protection for our nation and the establishment of it thereof. And we continue to pray for all of those who are serving in our military, both uh, within our borders and around the world, and our policemen and our firemen also. We pray for them and on their behalf and ask that you be with them. We pray for all the teachers within our country, Father. We just ask that you be with all of them and lead them to teach uh, our children well. We will not be coerced by uh, Satan's doctrines, but continue to teach truth and help to educate our nation so that we continue to be a strong and vibrant nation unto you. We pray for all of our churches, Father, throughout our country. We ask that you be with them also so that they continue to teach the truth of your word, that you uh, be with all of the pastors and provide for them in their every need, lead them in the truth, and ultimately continue to evangelize people within our border and those around the world as well. We also ask that you continue to raise up those with positive volition within our country to continue the pivot going forward for the blessings of our nation and so ultimately you are glorified along with your son Jesus Christ. So Father, we pray for all of these things and we ask that you uh, continue to be with us this evening and lead us now to lift up our hearts in song and in praise in Christ's precious name. Amen. <clears throat> all right, Cheryl, if you could come forward for our doxology. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time. 
Thank you very much, and please be seated. <coughs> All right, let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3. And here we continue to understand the narrative of the baptism of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, where predominantly we learned about John the Baptist and his ministry. But now in the last two verses of this section of chapter 3, in verses 21 we're understanding the baptism of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And tonight we're going to talk about the reasons of the uh, various imageries that we've seen thus far, but more importantly, the imagery of the Holy Spirit in the image of a dove. Remember, it wasn't a literal dove. It was the image or the form or the likeness of a dove. That's the best way they could describe what they saw. But ultimately, it talked about the indwelling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, the visible manifestation of the Spirit coming into our Lord Jesus Christ. So today, I'm going to take you through both the New Testament and the Old Testament applications of the dove and how that is used throughout the entire Bible so that we can understand a little bit more about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's ministry and also the ministry of the Holy Spirit, not only inside our Lord Jesus Christ, but also for you and I, the church age believers, because we too receive the exact same indwelling and filling ministry of the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ had while he was here on planet Earth. So we uh, can look at Luke chapter 3, and again in verses 21 and 22, <clears throat> and it reads, Now it came about when all the people were baptized, that Jesus also was baptized. And while he was praying, heaven opened up. And again, we talked about that on Sunday in the great pictures there, even a few simple words, but it really speaks volumes about the power of prayer of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God the Father hearing and answering prayers, not only for our Lord, but also ours on a daily basis. And then how heaven was opened up, how heaven and earth ultimately in this moment became one. And Jesus Christ being the temple of God, the temple of God being that go-between between heaven and earth that joins the two together. And we are in union with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have a heavenly citizenship because of the baptism of God, the Holy Spirit, that we receive. Now it says in verse 22, And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form, like a dove. And remember, we talked about already several principles as why our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was baptized. He wasn't repenting from his sin as the rest of the people were baptized for that reason. But it was a more of an identification both with the people first and foremost, then with God the Father and his great plan of salvation. And then also the uh, precursor and the prefiguring of him ultimately going to the cross dying for our sins, being buried, and on the third day being raised to eternal glory. So we see the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his baptism. Jesus Christ was identifying with his future work that it would accomplish salvation through his death, burial, and, and ultimately resurrection. I might have said baptism there when I meant resurrection a little earlier, but in any case, you know what I mean. All right, so the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. And we also talked on Sunday about uh, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In that narrative, we see a combination of the sonship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the propitiation of God the Father, that the work of salvation would be completely satisfied in the person of Jesus Christ, in whom I am well pleased. And I taught uh, you and gave you the notes in regard to how that phrase, in whom I am well pleased, was used at the birth narrative. It is used here at the baptism narrative. It was used at the transfiguration narrative. And then Peter also speaks to it in a resurrection narrative of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there we see the entire picture of what the Father is pleased in, the entire body of work that our Lord would accomplish during his incarnation at his first advent. So we go back now because uh, we kind of skipped over, but I wanted to bring you back to a few interesting principles that we have before us. It says, and the Holy Spirit. So we know that it's talking about the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, I don't have to give you that. Uh, you've seen that time and time again, but Hagios Numa, Holy 
Spirit, and it is talking about the third member of the Trinity, who is co-equal, co-infinite, and co-eternal with the Father and the Son. He descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And that's what I wanted to speak to, those three uh, phrases there, the descended in bodily form like a dove. Now, as heaven opened up and heaven and earth ultimately became one in that scenario, the Holy Spirit was sent by God the Father to indwell the, the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity. So we see that in the descending of the Holy Spirit. He too coming now down into earth in a form of an advent as it were, but not taking on physical form as Jesus Christ did, remaining in spiritual form as he indwelt the body of our Lord. <clears throat> But then we get to that phrase, in bodily form, and then we have like a dove. Really two things going on there. But in that bodily form, basically in bodily and like. So the bodily form and like are both trying to make sure we are not speaking literally here that the Holy Spirit took on a pigeon and then ultimately came into our Lord, okay? The Holy Spirit never became a bird and then came down from heaven and swooped into Jesus Christ. That's not what happened. It is not a literal thing. So that's why this is given to us in bodily form, like. So we have ultimately a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the form that could best be described like a dove and coming now into the body of Jesus Christ in his humanity. Remember, the deity of Jesus Christ is always indwelt by the deity of God, the Holy Spirit, because they are one, but not with the humanity. But yet the humanity of Jesus Christ was indwelt from the day of his birth because he has no old sin nature. But this was used in the reasons I gave you on Sunday to represent now the empowering, enabling ministry of God the Holy Spirit as Jesus then embarked on his mission to fulfill the ministry that God the Father had for him. So this was all so that the people could see it and also a benefit for John the Baptist. Because remember, God promised John the Baptist he would know who the Messiah was because that's the one that he would see that have the descending thing like a dove coming into him. That would be the Messiah and he then would know who he was. So again, all of that is given to us for the benefit of the people, for the benefit of John the Baptist, and also the, for the benefit of you and I, so that we understand that there is a literal indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. Like on the day of Pentecost, when they had flames that, uh, that looked like tongues of fire. It wasn't actually tongues, wasn't actually fire. But it looked like that. That's the best way they could describe it. And then that came and indwelt them. So as Jesus had that literal manifestation, the disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost had that literal manifestation. You and I received that as well, but we don't see a manifestation of it. We just receive it at the moment of our salvation. So again, all of this is given to us in bodily form, like a dove descending down so that the people would know, John the Baptist would know that this absolutely was the Messiah. And remember, it was the next day that he pointed to Jesus. It said, the Lamb of God uh, who comes to take away the sins of, or the sin of the world. And then it came upon him. This is another interesting phrase. Then I'm going to come back and talk about dove itself. But it came upon him. It's interesting that both Matthew and John and now Luke say upon him, only Mark says in him or into him. There's a different preposition. There's epi is used in Matthew, Mark, excuse me, in Matthew, John, and Luke. But then Mark used uh, ice, which means actually literally into. So this is talking about an upon. So it's a little different. Again, it's not actually into, but upon is that different type of connotation. And that is given to us for several reasons and several purposes. And the first and foremost thing is to fulfill prophecy. Because this is how it was explained to the Old Testament saints in the book of Isaiah, as Luke also recounts in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, at the reading of our Lord of the book of Isaiah. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 11, and let's look at these, uh, these narratives in regard to the uh, indwelling ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that uh, says that he came upon him. And again, to, uh, 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 to line up and to sync up with the Old Testament prophecy so that the uh, people of the Old Testament and the Old Testament saints would have a good understanding of these things. Uh, 
All right, so we're going to start with Isaiah. Did I say chapter 11 first? All right, so let's say Isaiah 11. <coughs> we'll see that one first. And in Isaiah chapter 11, specifically verse 2, but uh, again, going back to verse 11, we see this is a prophecy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ coming from the line of David. It says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. That was David's father. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. So again, we know from our New Testament studies that uh, the, the fruit bearing that we do is what? By means of God the Holy Spirit. And the only way that we can produce divine good, uh, the fruit of uh, 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 good fruits and the fruit of the Spirit is through the indwelling and fini uh, filling ministry of God the Holy Spirit. Now in verse 2 it says, And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears see. Here. So then it goes on to talk a little bit more about what our Lord would do. But the important aspect is what we have here back in verse 2, where it says, In the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. So again, upon him. So again, I'm going to show you something interesting that comes up in regard to this upon rather than into type of narrative. Let's go to chapter 42 now, and we see this again in verse 1. And this is that narrative in Isaiah about Jesus Christ being the suffering servant. And again, that he would uh, ultimately go to the cross for our sins. As it says in verse 40, uh, chapter 42, verse 1, it says, Behold my servant, whom I am uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. And again, that goes along with, in whom I am well pleased. So the Father's pleasure, or the propitiation of the Father through the Son. It says, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out to raise his voice. And I'll continue on. Nor make his voice heard in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. In a dimly, uh, excuse me, in a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. And then it goes continues on. But again, going back into verse two, as uh, verse one, in the second half, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice for or to the nations. And remember how John the Baptist refused to baptize Jesus Christ, and he said, "No, no, let it be. In this way, the two of us will bring about righteousness. We will fulfill all righteousness." Well, that's the justice that's in view here because justice and righteousness go hand in hand uh, as part of the attributes of who God the Father is and also the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we see the righteousness and justice of God coming forward and that is all done through the work of Jesus Christ and it all is made possible through the enabling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 61. Let's look at that. And once again, also uh, you know, just beginning in verse uh, 1, and I'll just uh, uh, share with you now the Luke chapter 4, verse 18 that I have up there on the board. This is what Jesus quoted in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. We're going to study this in just a few weeks from now when Jesus went into the synagogue to begin his ministry and he picked up the book of Isaiah. He read what we're about to read and he said, in your sight, this has been fulfilled. And the people freaked out. <laughs> Who are you to say that you are this? Okay, But we'll see that uh, in the coming days. Now in verse 61, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So again, upon me. So again, giving us that different connotation, that just the indwelling, but upon me. Again, he's all around me. He's with me. You know, he's every part of me. And that's what we need to understand as well. We talk about the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, but he's upon us. He is there ruling and mentoring our soul on a consistent basis. He was there to assist and rule and mentor Jesus' soul or the humanity uh, aspect of his soul as he went forward inside of God's ministry. So the Spirit of the Lord God, verse 1, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. 
Remember that. That's going to come up. To bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And that's where our Lord stopped in his quotation uh, when he uh, began his ministry. But it goes on to say, in the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then it goes on to say to grant those in, uh, who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And it's interesting, our Lord stopped there halfway through of, of verse 2 because in his first advent, that's what he was here to do. Die for our sins so that people could have salvation. As we see the second half of uh, of verse 2, we see him coming back in his second advent and bringing about judgment onto those who have rejected him. And then in verse 3, the blessing of judgment onto the uh, Israelites and to the nations that have believed him during his second advent. So he broke there because of the difference between his first coming and his second coming, as we understand. So... Upon him was first given to us so that we could understand the prophecies being fulfilled in regard to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and also the empowering, enabling ministry of the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, working with him and in him and through him throughout his entire ministry, even upon the cross. And again, even upon the cross. So it's interesting that uh, God has given us these phraseology and he's done it with specific terminology. He was very careful in what he has done because there are actually false doctrines that still somewhat circulate within uh, 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 Christianity and some parts of the world today, but became somewhat prevalent during the early church in a false doctrine and in a corrupt way. And there was a group called the Corinthian, not Corinthian, but Corinthian uh, Gnostics. And again, you know the cultic Gnostics that were an offshoot of Christianity, and uh, they believed in Gnosis, again, knowledge being the important thing, and it was all about raising up your knowledge, and then you ultimately would achieve spirituality and translate somehow, some way, if you had enough knowledge within your soul. Well, these individuals, the uh, Corinthian Gnostics, they believe that Jesus Christ didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit from the day of his birth. And they thought and they, they were teaching that this became the first time that the humanity of Jesus Christ was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But that is not uh, a true doctrine. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of defending that or refuting it. We're going to see that as we continue to go through this, that the, from the day of Jesus Christ's birth, as we've already noted, the Holy Spirit was upon him and with him. This was just a, a unique identification to number Jesus Christ with the transgressors, to talk about his future ministry of going to the cross, aligning with the plan of God the Father, and then also showing how the Holy Spirit gets us all ready for the ministry that we have as we go out into the wilderness. So uh, we aren't to confuse it and have false doctrines like that, that this was the first time for the indwelling spirit in Jesus Christ, and therefore now we had it uh, going forward. He always had it from the day of his birth. And at the same time, we don't confuse this baptism. And we talked about this in the seven different bapt- or the six baptisms that we see throughout the New Testament that the baptism of Jesus Christ is not the same as the baptism with the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism that Jesus gives to you and I at the day that we believe in him. The baptism with the Spirit is that identification that we have made by, through God the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ, being in union with him. This is not that at all. This was a unique baptism, a special baptism, uh, that the indwelling ministry of God the Holy Spirit then entering into him to empower him and enable him. All right, so we don't confuse it with those other doctrines that are applicable to the church age believer. So we also see that uh, uh, this hovering or this uh, being upon him reminds us going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Let's go there because we see some more interesting principles that we could also say was the beginning of the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And that has to do with the creation 
of the world, or the restoration, we should say, because remember, uh, heaven was uh, created eons ago, but then uh, it was formless and void, and then restored. And again, it became fall, formless and void because of the chaos of Satan and the fallen angels' corruption and their rebellion against God. God then you know, uh, 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 encapsulated uh, planet Earth in ice at that point in time. And then Genesis comes along, and now we understand the restoration of planet Earth. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is eons ago. And this is, uh, you know, pre to the, the ice encapsulating uh, planet Earth. This is where we would get our dinosaurs from during this prehistoric uh, time. Because in verse 2, it says, And the earth became formless and void. So God created it, but then it became, later on, formless and void. It says, And darkness uh, was over the earth of the deep. Now here's the interesting thing. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And again, when you look at the Hebrew there, it says he was hovering over, and it actually even has the connotation of like a mother hen sitting on her eggs, okay, waiting for them to hatch. And that's kind of the connotation that we have here in understanding this. But at the, cre the restoration of planet Earth, we see the Holy Spirit coming upon the Earth. And then we see from there the next six days of creation. And the seventh day, our Lord rested. So this reminds us of what God the Holy Spirit did for planet Earth, is what he is now doing in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what was that thing that the Holy Spirit was doing? He was about to bring life, what? Back to planet Earth. He was about to restore life because that's what we see for the next few days of creation. It's all about bringing plant life, animal life, creature life, and then ultimately human life to the fray or to the fore, I should say. But ultimately, it was about bringing forth life. And now when we see the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ, it was talking about the new life that he would bring to him in the ministry that Jesus Christ would then be able to go forward to accomplish what? Our salvation. So that all of mankind has the opportunity for a new spiritual life. So again, we see somewhat of an analogy. The Holy Spirit coming upon, utilizing that phraseology specifically, with the creation of planet Earth where he hovered over Earth and then brought new life into it. As the Holy Spirit came into Jesus Christ, he ultimately led him so that he could bring about new spiritual life for all members of the human race. But as you know, only those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ receive that new life. As we also see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter of the Spirit, but of the... Uh, 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 excuse me. Let me slow down. As a servant of new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but what? The Spirit gives life. You see, that's what the Holy Spirit's all about, to give life. Now, Jesus Christ had life. He already had life eternal because he was God. But he empowered him and enabled him to fulfill his ministry so that that new spiritual life could come to all members of the human race. And I can remind you of both the uh, Galatians and Corinthians passages that talk about us being new creations, new spiritual species. We can understand that through the Holy Spirit. We're a new creation, a new uh, nature inside of us. He has given us new life. We are born again, John 3, 16. When we believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we must, or, uh, or prior to that, we must be born again. And the Holy Spirit's the one that makes that all possible, first by making it possible for Jesus Christ to be sustained through the cross, and then for those who believe his indwelling ministry upon them gives them that life. Now, we also see fascinating, or interestingly enough, in verse 3 of Genesis 1, it says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So what's the first thing that happened when the Holy Spirit hovered over the earth? He brought forward what? Light. And light was necessary to do what? Bring about life. And who was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? He's the light of the world, according to John chapter 8, verse 12, and 9, uh, verse 5. 
So again, we see this analogy of the Holy Spirit's indwelling ministry of Jesus Christ, signified through the dove ascending uh, at the, uh, just after the baptism of our Lord. And it brings us all the way back to the creative act of our Holy Spirit, which Jesus Christ was also part and partial, uh, part and parcel with, as he was the creator of the heavens and the earth. The Holy Spirit hovered over the earth, and then he brought forth light. And with that light, now life was able to come onto planet earth. And oh, by the way, when you look at that light, it's not talking about the sun and the moon. That comes later. And the sun and the moon come after this. But first he created light. And we don't know what that light is other than we can understand that God brought that light into the world. What that light is? Probably God himself or Jesus Christ just illuminating over the earth rather than it being in complete darkness. <clears throat> because later in the genitive narrative, we see the moon and the sun being created for the governing of the day and the night. All right, so moving on in our understanding of the Holy Spirit, we see that the giving of the Holy Spirit to Jesus Christ was a great symbol. And it was also a symbol of his anointing. Remember, we just read that in Isaiah, my anointed one, when it talks about uh, 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 Jesus Christ uh, 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 and, you know, with the whole dove analogy and the Spirit being upon him. It also talked about the anointing. And that's what the Holy Spirit also does. He anoints. And what does the anointing mean? Well, we've talked about that. We go back to the Old Testament and we see how anointing was used to establish a priest or a king or anyone that would go about and to uh, now endeavor on a new mission or ministry. They would be anointed with oil, all a picture of the empowering, enabling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's what Jesus Christ also received because he received the anointing so that he could fulfill his threefold ministry of being a prophet, a priest, and a king. Let's go to Luke now and let's see how Jesus read uh, Isaiah 61 in the Gospel of Luke. Let's just go there and look at verse uh, chapter 4. And then specifically in verses 16 through 19. <coughs> And again, we're just going to point out in this, the anointing is another reason for the indwelling ministry of uh, God, the Holy Spirit, to signify now he is going forward to begin this new ministry. I'm going to show you something on the next slide, but let's read this. All right, uh, verse 16. It says, And he came to Nazareth, talking about Jesus, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book, of, uh, the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. And again, this is Isaiah 61 for us. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. A couple of analogies there. One, that's the, the, the priesthood of Jesus Christ where now he's preaching the gospel, okay, to preach the gospel, and then also to the poor. Remember what the dove sacrifice was all about? That was the poor man's sacrifice. So again, we see that tie-in with the dove, as I'm going to share with you in a minute, uh, with the poor sacrifice, so uh, you know, th those who couldn't afford the, the more expensive sacrifices, but ultimately it's talking about the poor being the sinners, which we all are. It says, He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, Who's able to release captives? Only a king. Only a king can give somebody a freedom who has been a slave. So again, we see the kingship of Jesus Christ coming forward. And recovery of sight to the blind, ultimately the prophet who had uh, the empowering ministry of the Holy Spirit could give sight back to the blind and to set free those who are downtrodden to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And that's all he read. And then it said he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Can you believe they're all like giving him the stink eyes, we call it, okay? They're all looking at him like, who the heck do you think you are, okay? Uh, but in any case, <clears throat> we see Jesus Christ in the three-pronged uh, uh, ministry that he came to fulfill as the prophet, as the priest, and as the king. 
And Jesus Christ prophesied about his own death time and time again. And he prophesied about his second coming. He prophesied about uh, uh, what uh, would bring about salvation. As a priest, he was able to, uh, to uh, deliver the message of God, to give the gospel to those who are lost. And as a king, he came to give freedom to those who are enslaved. Again, everyone who was enslaved to sin, he gave uh, or he has the power to release them because of his royalty and his kingship. So the Holy Spirit was given to him to anoint him, to set him off on this new mission that he had with the prophet, priest, and kingly authority that he needed to bring forward. As the anointed one, which we know he is, and remember Messiah means anointed one in the Hebrew, so that comes forward as we see the Messiah or even Christos in the Greek language, talking about the anointed one. It was the visible manifestation of God doing what? Appointing him, accepting him, and approving of him so that he could go forward into the ministry. And by giving the Holy Spirit, God the Father is giving complete acceptance to who Jesus Christ is and what he would do and ultimately accomplish, which also is followed up in the uh, same passage in that phrase, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father appointed him from eternity past. God the Father accepted Jesus Christ as the one to fulfill his plan of salvation. God the Father approved of everything that he would do. He was propitiated, as we say, and ultimately the ministry of Jesus Christ bringing about salvation to all of mankind. At the same time, as I said earlier, in these passages, we see the sonship of Jesus Christ and the anointing of Jesus Christ going hand in hand. The anointing to go out and fulfill the ministry of God the Father goes along with his sonship, and Jesus Christ carried that through from the day of his birth to the day of his ascension, being seated at the right hand of God the Father. The sonship and the anointing going together, as Luke brings out in both the Gospel of Luke and also in the book of Acts, uh, as we'll uh, read later on. Luke 4, 22, and also in Acts chapter 9, verses 20 and 22. All right, so the descending of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus also expresses the reality of the, uh, the Spirit's equipping, empowering, and enabling. And uh, 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 what we understand from this is what God the Holy Spirit does for all of us. He equips us to go forward in the plan so that we can learn the Word of God and apply it. He empowers us to give us the strength of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the Word and the mind of Christ. And He enables us so that we can learn it and then apply it as we go forward. God the Holy Spirit did that with Jesus Christ so that He could learn, understand, and apply the Word in a fantastic way, especially when He was about to embark on the 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, and even more importantly, when He hung upon the cross. God the Holy Spirit sustained him throughout his entire ministry. And again, the deity of, the whole, uh, of Jesus Christ did not need this empowering enabling. He had that already from day one. He had it from eternity past. He's all powerful God. Jesus in his deity did not need this. But the humanity of Jesus Christ, he needed this to work and function in a fantastic way, but at the same time to also demonstrate to us what we would have during the church age, the power, the strength, the enabling, the equipping that we have by God the Holy Spirit to go forward inside of his plan. Again, Luke chapter 4, Acts 4 and Acts 10 also speak to that, not only for Jesus Christ, but we see it for uh, early church members as well. Now, let's get into the dove a little bit. I get, uh, the Greek word. I don't know if I've showed you the Greek word uh, for this before, but peristera, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, peristera, that's how you pronounce it, peristera. Uh, basically, this word is only used, as I've mentioned to you before, for this, uh, uh, and it's used only in this narrative of the baptism of the Holy Spirit into the body of Jesus Christ or upon the body of Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, and John. Luke also mentions it. So again, it is used here. The only other time that the word dove and uh, peristera, uh, per peristera is used within the New Testament is for the sacrificial dove. And 
first and foremost for Joseph and Mary that they sacrificed for the cleansing or the purification process after the birth and all, uh, of Jesus, and then also for the dedication of Jesus to God the Father. We see the dove being sacrificed there because they were not of means, so they used the poor man's sacrifice to go along with the analogy of why Jesus came to the world for the poor. And then also we see it for the sacrificial doves that were part of our Lord's temple incident twice, where he turned over the money changing tables for those who were selling, what, the sacrificial animals, and it specifically mentions the doves in that scenario. Sometimes it's pigeon, sometimes it's turtle dove, but it's used in those scenarios. So again, in those two places are the only time that dove is used within the New Testament. The sacrificial animal, and then also for the narrative of who God the Holy Spirit would uh, look like as he descended into our Lord Jesus Christ. So really, when we understand this, we understand that God the Holy Spirit is part and parcel with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the descending of the Holy Spirit was all about what? Getting him to the cross, where he would be the sacrificial lamb for all of mankind. In Matthew, we see that in 10. Uh, you see that in Mark and John and Luke. You see the narratives of the sacrificial animal being used. And we see it now in relationship to a figure that manifested the Holy Spirit coming into Jesus Christ and being upon him so that ultimately he would be the greatest sacrifice, the one sacrifice that God was looking for, the sacrifice of his son. So the dove represents many things. It represents the preparation of the true sacrifice for our sins. That's what it's all about. Jesus Christ would be the propitiation of God the Father. He's the one and only necessary sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. And the dove gives us that analogy as well especially when we go back to the Old Testament and we see it as one of the sacrificial animals, and as I said, especially for the poor, those who were not of means. If you had means, you would purchase a lamb or you would purchase a bull even or a goat or some kind of sheep. But if you didn't have means, you would go and get a dove, also called turtle dove or sometimes called pigeon, same word uh, uh, used in the Hebrew, uh, one word used in the Greek, even though the Septuagint uses two different words, another topic for another day. But in any case, we see it utilized for this sacrificial animal that was for those who were poor, the exact same people that Jesus came to, which ultimately means the sinner. From an Old Testament perspective, we see the dove, and the Hebrew word is yana. And Yanar, and remember, Hebrew goes from right to left, just to remind you of the Hebrew language and what it looks like. Uh, the comma at the end is just a separation, but that little uh, 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 first mark on the far right, that's the Y. And then we have the N with the dot being the O. And then the uh, uh, we have the, uh, yeah, the Y, then the O with the dot above. Yep, And then we have the N with the A at the bottom, the T, and then the H at the end, if you want to know Hebrew. okay. But too much detail for tonight. But <laughs> in any case, that is the Greek word, excuse me, the Hebrew word, yana, and it does mean dove, pigeon, or turtle dove. And it was also used specifically throughout the uh, Old Testament in a number of different ways. And I wanted to share those with you because uh, it also gives us understanding of what Jesus Christ accomplished on our behalf. And the first time that it was used is in the narrative of the flood. Literally, the first time the word dove or yana is used in the Old Testament is in Genesis chapter 8. Let's turn there now. Let's look at Genesis chapter 8. Many of you are somewhat or maybe very familiar with this narrative in regard to the flood. But this is after the flood and when the waters were subsiding. Noah had a plan to figure out if the land could what? Be inhabited once again. And when it would be time for them to leave the ark and be able to go outside the ark and live and what? Have new life. Okay? So very interesting how these analogies all come together. And in, uh, in the book of Genesis in chapter 8, you see a lot of that narrative. And if you go down, let's see, how far down? Well, let's go down to uh, verse 4. 
It says in verse 4, And in the seventh month, on the seventh day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, remember, the ark is also a symbol of the cross of Jesus Christ, okay? Because that's what sustained the people through the flood. And the flood was what? The destruction of sin and uh, evil. And the cross of Jesus Christ, what? Sustains us through evil and sin and gives us new life. So the ark is a direct analogy to the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So it says in verse 5, And the water decreased steadily until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Then it came about at the end of 40 days, again another 40 days, that Noah opened the window of the ark which he made. And he sent out one, he sent out a raven, and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Now that's all we see of the raven. I'm going to come back. Uh, let's see, did I talk about that right now? Yeah, I'll talk about it right now. All right. The raven, very interestingly, when, the, when we get the lore a little bit after this, not a little bit, but many years after this, when we finally get the lore and God tells the Israelites what is clean and unclean animals, the raven was an unclean animal, okay? They couldn't use it as a sacrifice. They couldn't use it uh, a, you know, to even eat, let's say. It was unclean. But the dove, they could sacrifice. The dove and the pigeon, they could eat. So the raven was unclean. And what we see of that, it flew back and forth, back and forth, and ultimately, when land finally came, it just disappeared. Okay? Didn't come back to the ark. When it got out of the ark, when he let it go, it had wanted nothing to do with the ark whatsoever. And basically, that's an analogy of the sinner. Okay? Didn't want anything to do with the cross. That's the raven. Okay? Now we go on. It says, then it came about, no, no verse 7. It says, and he, uh, uh, no, verse Eight, let's get down there. All right, then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. Now that is what the whole emphasis is all about, the dove finding a resting place. And again, couldn't find one at first. So she returned to him into the ark. She came back to the ark, came back to the cross. For the water was on the surface of the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark himself. So he waited yet another seven days. Again, seven being the number of spiritual perfection. And again, he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came to him towards evening. And behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. And a lot of times people say branch, but uh, leaf is the... Uh, Better translation there. It says, so Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. And then he goes on to say, then he waited yet another seven days, spiritual perfection, and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. And again, that's not like the raven in this case. This is after it came back with the olive branch or the olive uh, leaf. And now after another spiritual time of spiritual perfection, the dove went out because now it found good land where it could have life. And ultimately the new life that had begun to grow and be given by God. So now the dove could go out and live in that place. And as you read the rest of the narrative, then God tells uh, Noah, open up the ark and let everybody out. Now you can go down into the land, just like the dove now is in the land, living in the new life. But what is interesting about that is that first she found no resting place, but then came back with an olive branch, and that also has all kinds of analogy to Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, the branch of Jesse, as we read earlier. Again, we see that in this narrative. The life-giving one. So again, now that she ultimately came back and brought that life and demonstrated that new life, now she had her own resting place. But at first there was no resting place. Now there was a resting place. So the Ark of the Covenant, where the dove is first used, is talking about what? Finding a place of rest. So that tells us what this ministry of God the Holy Spirit is all about. Because in Peter, we're going to turn there now. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3 in verses 19 through 22. Again, let's go to the end of the Bible. Almost just before, oh, just before the book of Revelation. 
Peter is the one who gives us the analogy between the ark and the dove and now Jesus Christ and the dove. And we see the analogy coming together and what the dove represented there, a resting place. And that's what Jesus Christ is to you and I. He is our resting place. The Holy Spirit empowered him so that he wouldn't have to toil and work on his own, but would empower and enable him, giving him the ability to, uh, to go out and defeat sin and Satan and win the strategic victory of the angelic conflict and do it in the power of God. You see, that's what he does for us as well. We have our resting place in Jesus. We have salvation. We've been freed from sin. But at the same time, we should be resting in God, the Holy Spirit, resting in God the Father, resting in God the Son, as we go out and serve. Not doing it on our own strength, in our own power, in our own resources. When you do, you'll get exhausted. That's why many people leave ministry, because they're exhausted. They're using their own power. But when we use the power of God, and especially God the Holy Spirit, because of our salvation in Jesus Christ, we are at rest. And we have all the strength necessary to go forward. Now in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verses 19 through 22. Let me get there myself. All right, make sure I'm in chapter 3. I am. All right. All right, so in uh, verse 19, uh, let's go back to verse 18 just to get some context. It says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, by which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. That's when Jesus descended and he proclaimed victory. Now in verse 20 it says, Who once were disobedient, when the uh, pers- uh, excuse me, patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. So here we see where Noah is, excuse me, where Peter now is tying the baptism of Jesus Christ with the ark that led the people through the water and saved the animals as well. And uh, again, God allowing to bring forth new life like the creation that we saw, a restoration of the heavens and the earth, specifically the earth in Genesis chapter 1. We see the hovering Holy Spirit bringing forth new life, bringing light into the world, then bringing life. Then we see at the destruction of planet earth because of sin, because of the uh, corruption that was brought by the uh, fallen angels cohabitating with women, corrupting society, and sin going against God's uh, a plan for the angelic conflict. He had to destroy all of creation other than Noah and the animals that were in the ark. But then at the end of that period of time, we see the dove coming forward, signifying that there's new life for all. Animal life, plant life, restoration now of planet Earth once again. As we bring all of that back to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we see why the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, because He is the one that brings about new life to you and I. The Holy Spirit empowers us and enables us to live that new life as we go forward. And as the Old Testament also uses the analogy of the dove for that resting place, for that empowering, enabling ministry, in Psalm 55, 6, it says, I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. You see, if I had the wings of a dove, we could rest. In other words, we do have that through the Holy Spirit. In verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 68, in verse 13, it says, When you lie down, among the sheep, uh, lie down among the sheepfolds, you are like the wings of a dove covered with silver and its pinions with glistening gold. That's the glorification when we have the Holy Spirit. Now in Jeremiah 48, verse 28, it says, Leave the cities and dwell among the crags, which is the rocks and the clefts, uh, O inhabitants of Moab, and be like a dove that nests beyond the mouth of the chasm. And that's all analogy for 
being outside of hell. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, enabling Jesus Christ, he brought about salvation to the world. Through Jesus Christ, we have rest in the Word, in the Holy Spirit, and we escape the mouth of the chasm. We escape hell. That's a, 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 a storyline in regard to the Israelites coming back from captivity, but at the same time having rest in God as he provides. We also see this in Hosea chapter 11, verse 11. It says, They will come trembling like birds from Egypt. This too is talking about the captivity and the freedom of captivity. And like doves from the land of Assyria. Remember the northern uh, Israel was taken over by Assyria and they were held captive by them. Again, like doves from the land of Assyria. I will settle them in their houses, declares the Lord. What is that? Rest. Just as the dove found rest at the, at the ark of Noah, the dove of the Holy Spirit continues to provide us rest each and every day. So a couple of more things, and then we'll be finished with the analogy and uh, with the baptism narrative. Being the sacrifice of the poor as Jesus Christ was, and the poor being every member of the human race because we all are poor sinners, it was most likely also that sacrifice that they would use and again, we see this in Mark and uh, Matthew and John. Remember how this sacrifice of the dove was the poor man's sacrifice? Well, we see that what? That poor man's sacrifice was abused. And it was abused by the money changers, abused by those who were selling in the temple to make a coin, as we would say, off of the sacrifice that was due unto the Lord. We can also assume that many people were also abusing the sacrificial rite. And they were claiming, oh, I'm poor, I'm poor, I'm poor. I don't want to spend all my money on the lamb. Let me just go spend it. Buy a couple of doves over here for a penny or two. I'll give that to the Lord. I'll be okay. It's in the law. It's okay. Even though they could have afforded a lamb. You see, many people abuse God's rights and his provision. God came and ultimately was the sacrifice for the poor, the wretched, rotten sinner. Many of us have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, but not all of us continue to go forward in the plan of God. And we act like we're poor, and we don't use the power of the Holy Spirit. We grieve him. We quench him. We don't rely upon him. We never truly enter into that rest that otherwise God has provided for us. And instead, what do we do? We live our life unto the world. We spend our money on the things of this world rather than on the things of God. And we are abusing the right that God has given to us to live freely and to offer things up to him. And we're not giving him the highest and best of our offering, of our sacrifices each and every day. So again, let us not be those types that are abusing the rights of offering that God gives to us, the freedom of volition that even though we're saved, again, our salvation has been determined. Let's not abuse that and not do good works through the fruit of the Spirit as we go forward. There's many a believer who have accepted Jesus Christ and then now are skating through life. But ultimately, they're going to be surprised one day when they find out that they did not do a job well done. They did not live unto the Lord as they, had sh they should have because they abused the rites and the ritual of God as many were abusing the rites and ritual of God during his day, Jesus' day, when he was here on planet Earth. And what did Jesus Christ do? He went into the temple and he cleansed the temple. Get this sin out of here. Get the cosmic world out of here. Get the money changers out of here. And again, we need to also allow Christ to do that within our heart and allow the Holy Spirit to get us cleansed so that we go forward walking in the will and the plan of God. As the Holy Spirit descended into Jesus to bring about new life for all of mankind, we have received that new life. Let us now live that life, not in an abusive way, not taking advantage of the freedom and the, uh, the uh, blessing of salvation that is eternally secure. Let's not abuse that. Instead, let us live the new life richly each and every day, offering our highest and best sacrifice to God that we possibly can. Now, there's another analogy that I wanted to share with you, and you could read this uh, in the poetic nature of Song of Solomon in chapter 2, in chapter 5, and in chapter 6. And the dove is there used in the Old Testament to speak about what? The beautiful words that are coming forward from his dove. 
and it's talking about a picture of uh, you know God the Holy Spirit along with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the great love relationship that God has with us but it's talking about the beautiful words that come from the mouth of the dove that's the beautiful words of Bible doctrine the mind of Jesus Christ that come from the scriptures that we should be taking into our soul and then applying it each and every day so this analogy of the dove coming into Jesus Christ, talking about the mind of Jesus Christ, the beautiful word, the Bible doctrine that we now have, the Bible that we now have to live and learn and then ultimately apply. We have the beauty of God full within the Holy Spirit. For so as we understand, for those who reject God, the dove also has indicated and continues to indicate the suffering and insufficiency that man has without him. And again, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, passages coming up in the Old Testament that you can read up on, on your own. But in those cases, it's talking about those who have abused the ministry of the Holy Spirit in, in utilizing the Old Testament analogy. They didn't take the things of God seriously. They went in, into the world. They went after pagan gods. And ultimately, there was suffering and insufficiency within their life. But it all was designed to point them back to the true dove, to get them back to the true wisdom, to get them back to the ark, to get them back ultimately to the cross of Jesus Christ and a relationship with God. So in these Old Testament passages of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Nahum, it was all pointing to the insufficiency that the people would have when they didn't have the dove in their life. But when we do have the dove in our life, Ultimately, we have the equipping, the empowering, the enabling ministry. We have the pleasure of God within our life as well. And the dove analogy is used to show the suffering and insufficiency as well as used to point them back to the true dove so that ultimately we go back to the cross of Jesus Christ. We go back to our first love, Jesus himself, get his thoughts and minds, his word in our soul through the empowering, enabling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, and ultimately live and walk unto God to the fullest that we possibly can be. That's when God will say to us, as he said to his son, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And you are a son, daughter of God, and he will be well pleased with you as you walk inside his will through the empowering, enabling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. All right, so that uh, gives us a lot of analogies about the dove, and as we see that in a survey throughout the Old and the New Testament, but it was given to us for a reason, because the Holy Spirit is that true empower and enabler for us to live the spiritual life glorifying God. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your spirit that is there for us each and every day. And we especially thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that has established all of this for us, our salvation, his word that is given to us so that we could be strengthened and be at rest more and more with you in our great relationship each and every day. And so, Father, we ask that you lead us to enter into that rest experientially, not just positionally, but live it each and every day as we glorify you. So, Father, we ask for your travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.